um, what has Islamization uh, meant for for society? In Pakistan, around Islamization, it, it's a little difficult to give the answer that concisely because the process took a long time. But I think initially, when the process was initiated or the so-called slogan of Islamization was started. Perhaps a lot of us tended not to take it too seriously. It was a joke, it was a farce, it was a feeling of something totally alien being imposed on us because Islamization in this country meant Islam, Saudi Arabia, what was being imported from the Middle East and uh, imposed on us and it didn't seem possible that this could happen in this country. So for a long time perhaps our reaction was not to take it seriously, not to believe it could happen and perhaps one didn't want to believe it could happen. The impact at one level of course was a very small insidious one which is where society has come about. At another level I feel it was very rapid because it unleashed a lot of the well, in my words, the sick minds, the elements which had no say in society or which one hoped gradually to eliminate the thinking, that came to the forefront. It received a sanction from the highest levels and that, that of course was an immediate effect. The insult, the feeling of insecurity, people feeling they had the right to um, take law into their own hands and impose it on others. At another level, of course, I think the effect was very slow and that's perhaps what we were not aware of. The gradual feeling of disintegration of society, the very gradual desensitization, which came about starting with the punishments, the, you know, the first whipping and the screams of the people being whipped when they came across on radio, it was this gradual brutalization of society. And it, it, it started then and it continued over those 14 years. And definitely it had, it had a very damaging effect on society. The whole attitude, attitudes towards each other, attitudes towards women, not just women, the weaker classes, basically. And in our weaker classes, women were figured very largely. They were the easiest target for the state. But definitely over this period came about a feeling it was the state against us. It was us and them. And in Pakistani society, it's had its own share of corruption. It's had its own problems with the various governments that have come about. But there was always that hope. You never really thought about this clear demarcation between state and us. But I think here when it came about, the combination then of military and Islam, which were the two factors uh, came together, that was a lethal combination. It gave a go ahead to the fundamentalists who'd never had a say, who would never have come in through popular vote, who never had come in through popular vote, and who'd been rejected by the people. It gave them the go ahead. Islam gave the further sanction to the military government militarization which had been objected to, people had protested against it. Now, combined with Islam, it gave it a total go-ahead and militarization was then being carried on as a right arm of Islam. In terms of the institutions that are there to protect people, uh, the, the judiciary, etc., um, how would you respond to that? I mean, they are there to protect people. How are they protecting people? Well, the institutions, when you're talking about institutions that protect people, you're uh, talking about the law enforcement ag agencies, basically. There are your law enforcement agencies, your police, your judiciary. And, of course, you're also talking about your legislature and your executive, which are the arms which make the laws or which implement them. Of course, it had a very debilitating effect. It was um, extremely damaging, as it is our law enforcement agencies and institutions. We've uh, had uh, great doubts about them, but that was because of society as a whole. I mean, it wasn't just these institutions, but one had felt that um, corruption, lack of efficiency, poverty, all these had had their effect on the effectiveness of these. But uh, once the process of Islamization started, I think 
the little expectation that one had of these institutions was totally, those hopes were totally shattered. They were totally corrupted at one level because of the laws themselves, which gave the law enforcement agencies a go ahead. For example, if we're talking about rape, for the first time, uh, came about this concept of, you know, if you were accused of, whether you went in accusing someone of rape or whether you were accusing of another crime, you were presumed guilty till proven innocent instead of the other way about, which was a normal presumption of law, you are, you are pre presumed innocent until proven guilty. The whole slant changed and certainly the odds were way heavily against you with this new institution. Another important thing you have to remember is that with the process of Islamization and General Zayal Haq, the constitution was also changed. The judiciary, which till then was supposedly independent, with the introduction of the Federal Sharia Court, you now had judges appointed and the Federal Sharia Court who were no longer accountable. These were judges who were appointed directly by the President. This was brought about with this introduction of certain articles in the Constitution. So you now had a judiciary which was not subject to your judicial code, which all the other judges were subject to, which was not subject to the judicial Supreme Judicial Council, to whom all other judges are subject. They were only accountable to the President. And the President had the power to hire them. The President had the power, the power to fire them. They took no oath under the Constitution. So the whole system of the judiciary was corrupted from that point onwards anyway. But would you say that the law is against uh, the poor and the oppressed, the minorities, women? When you, to, when you see the law as such, you see, when you look at our constitution, basically, um, the seeming impression is that there are equal rights for all, including women, minorities, etc. It talks about protection, it talks about equal rights, it talks about there being no discrimination in the laws. But then we come into the actual situation in hand because the constitution is there but primarily the implementation of the constitutional clauses depends on your executive, your judiciary, your legislature. If your judiciary is controlled, your executive is in any case there as a matter of force. I mean, Zayal Haq didn't come in on any other justification except force. That was The justification was Islam. The force behind was the military. So there was no justification. He was getting away with blue murder. Your legislature was something which was held picked by him and appointed. So in any case, there were no checks. There are no checks on these things. So that is there. Now, when that comes in, who are you against? Are the poor getting an equal deal? The poor don't get an equal deal in this country anyway. But with Islamization, you were protecting certain interests. And what interests were you protecting? You are protecting, one, the interests of your dominant classes. Two, your handpicked legislature was nevertheless belonging to your feudal families, belonging to your industrialists, but certainly your upper income classes. Even the normal protection that was given to the weaker classes or the oppressed classes was totally taken away. That was not an interest and because they were not accountable to the people at any rate. That's not why they were there. Even the pretense, or, uh, you know, even that was not kept up. There was much mouthing about Islam. But there was never any attempt, there was never any pretense that that's who they were protecting or that's who, uh, that uh, the uh, lower classes or the poor was who they were out to help. So, who were the people who were affected primarily? Who no were a direct target? Women were an immediate direct target. Women are always an immediate direct target. The moment the politicians talk about Islam, you know that you are targeted. Because you are the easiest target. You are the target who has the least support. You are the target which is least likely to come out and protest. And you are always out there, number one, because... The word Islam is mentioned, a lot of people draw back because of that without even understanding whether, what Islam is, whether this is Islam. I mean, a lot of different kinds, a number of people might have been objecting because they were against the whole idea of Islam. There were others who believed in Islam, but certainly 
uh, didn't know whether this was Islam, so to speak, or not. If but if you are in a minority and a woman in this country, you really have no hope. You have no hope, Pani. I mean, minorities were the next target, along with women. Were minorities, and over here there was not just a tacit discrimination against them. There was a clear discrimination. It may have been there socially to some extent anyway, but here we were given the legal sanction now to discriminate. So women and minorities were a clear target. The poor, no one was pushed, and certainly I mean, as a woman, if you belong to a minority group, and if you were poor. You have had it. I mean, you just have no hope in this society. And Farad actually was all three. Farad was all three, and she realized that, and that's a feeling of helplessness and frustration that you get in this society, a sort of apathy. You already know the dice are loaded against you. Poor, you know our law enforcement agencies. You know where the money is going to count. You know where the influence is going to count. As a minority. You know the social attitudes, which was intensified by this whole process of Islamization, and you could see it during the whole case. I mean, the view, the attitudes at every level, even of the judiciary, was you know these women. So, I mean, as a lower class person, how did you hear of the case, and how did Women's Action Forum get involved? Now, we had the Farid case, of course. Um, uh, we read about it for the first time in the dawn. It had come across as a small report in the dawn that two nurses had been raped and that one of them had been picked up and was confined in the police station. This came about actually um, a few days or about 10 days, I think, after the actual rape had taken place. We picked it up from the newspaper and we decided to follow it up. There, was no other, there were no details about it, merely that this rape had taken place. So we did follow up by going to the police station, which had been mentioned in the news report, and heard from there that Farid had been taken for police remand, for, uh, further for police remand to the magistrate's court. So we went across to the court. And uh, that's where we met Farid and her father for the first time. And um, talked to them, tried to find out whether she had legal help, tried to find out what had happened. and. That's where it started building up and one realized for the first time the implications of the case. Parath was scared. Parath was scared. She didn't know what was happening to her. She didn't know what was going to happen to her. The family was scared. They, they didn't know about the law. They had no access to a lawyer. And, uh, it had caught them totally unprepared. Parath had been taken to the police station for questioning, for her statement. And when she made, made a statement alleging rape, she had been taken into custody instead. So they were petrified and didn't know where to turn. But this is a, not an isolated case. Uh, why was there so much um, mobilization around it? It was what not. What was the mobilization anyway? You see, actually, what happens in this country, the cases of rape are not isolated. Rape is, uh, has been is taking place. Um, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's really a very widespread problem. You keep hearing about it. You keep hearing about isolated incidents. But in fact, there are very few incidents which reach the court. And when this did reach the court, uh, one, of course, one wanted to help Farad because one knew that she was in a position where she had no support or help, either from the family at home or from the hospital none of the institutions. The hospital was not supportive. Her family was scared. She was certainly not getting support, even from her own community at that time, because they were afraid. Uh, so one was, of course, a desire just to help her. But two was certainly to pick up any of these cases, because we wanted the injustices of the system and of the law highlighted. And one wanted to make pick up the few cases and make them test cases and try to see them through with all the support that we could muster. Not just to have the case, merely to highlight the case. One wanted, hopefully, to see a case go through successfully where a woman could get some justice. But of course, it brought home to us how difficult it was for any woman to achieve any measure of justice in this country. 
And when we got to Farhat, and of course we realized that she needed little help, and there were about three or four of us who had gone from Women's Action Forum. This was really a case that Women's Action Forum started off with. And they picked it up and realized that there was um, a number of uh, areas in which Farhat and family needed support. One, of course, was the legal aspect. They needed a lawyer, basically. Two, of course, was uh, just reassurance and support for, uh, with the family. They needed to feel that there was a support group around. They were isolated, once again, as I've said. They, they were poor, they were minorities, and there was a question of a girl involved, a woman. So uh, they, was, they were frightened. So at that point, we did move around. The first uh, people we did contact were the uh, human rights group, the Human Rights Association. We got in touch with the lawyers for human rights and legal aid. That was the major priority, which was arranging a lawyer. But apart from arranging a lawyer, one needed people to run around, to meet the family, to meet, to find out what was going on in the court, to meet the police, to try to agitate at different levels. So that is where a number of organizations then came in voluntarily. Some, of course, because uh, members of WAF belong to different organizations. But even where they didn't, Support then came pouring in because this was once again a case that had hit the newspapers and it became a test case. So you had a whole range of organizations offering support. As I've said, the Human Rights Commission, the Lawyers for Legal Aid and Human Rights, but then you came in as Aurat Foundation or as Shirkat Ka, the resource centers came in. Sorry. 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 Why having played this initial role a lot, there was a lot of mobilization by other groups as well. There was a lot of mobilization. Life, as I said, picked it up from the newspapers. But uh, obviously, there was a starting point <coughs> before that. And this, perhaps, is when, when one sees the combination of the different groups or the people who played a role, I mean, in this case particularly, one, of course, was a major contribution by the journalists. The case was highlighted, and uh, Nafisa Hoodboy from Dawn played a very major role in highlighting this. It wasn't merely as a journalist or investigative reporter. She attended the courts. She picked up the case. She highlighted the important issues that were arising in the case. It was not merely a routine reporting. It was picking up the issues from the point of view of the justice system, from the point of view of women, so the issues were picked up, the minority issue, the poverty problem, they were all picked up as issues and highlighted. So the journalists played a very major role and there were a number of meetings in the press club. The resource centers played a different kind of supportive role, which was of course contacting organizations, attending courts, giving the sort of support to Farhat and family which was required. The, another major organization that played a very important role actually because and none of this would have been successful without the participation of the nurses and the Nurses Action Committee. The nurses, for the first time, mobilized themselves and came across. And that, of course, was a central element. No kind of protest or movement could have taken place without the participation of the nurses. And here the Democratic Women's Association came in because the Democratic Women's Association was working largely with the nurses. They were helping in mobilizing. They were giving them the necessary support. So you had the legal aid bodies. You had the resource centers. Asir came in. And these now are organizations that you're talking about. People who are not necessarily on the scene. You were now getting support from people and organizations who came in. So there was that added effort. It was not merely being there and taking it on. But organizations which took it on as a major issue. Asir came in that time in support talking about the case, making arrangements, trying to highlight the case again. And then you had uh, Punjab Women Lawyers. We were all representatives from these various organizations, all trying to put in the little bit we could, whether it was on the legal side, whether it was on the side of highlighting or lobbying with the media, whether it was at the level of meeting the police and trying to get protection. We did meet the Home Secretary, we did meet the IG, we did go running out to the DIGs when Bharat and family were being harassed by different elements, the boys accused of rape. So then it was a supportive movement and the nurses played a pivotal role in this whole thing. In fact, they came out for the first time on the streets, they wanted to protest. 
And interestingly, that was it was at that time for the first time that uh, another group came in, which was least expected at that time, which was women from the jamaat e islami As women, they could identify rape was a common problem, rape was a common issue. And we were contacted by women from the jamaat e islami when they heard that we were carrying out this demonstration. By we, I mean the nurses, the Democratic Women's Association, where for it was a number of organizations. The women from the jamaat e islami contacted us and said they wanted to be a part of this protest, again, the, again, this demonstration. So they did participate in the demonstration, or they started off by participating. Later, of course, there was a problem with the jamaat e islami What was the problem? Well, um, the problem was that basically while we were picking up the Farad case as an issue and we were helping in this case, we didn't feel that we could isolate this case from the overall issue of Hadood, which was the Islamic laws brought in by General Ziaul Haq, that we couldn't just take a short-term action on a rape, unless one saw it in the larger context of what Islamization had done to this country, about what it had done to society. So it had to be, I mean, you couldn't take on an issue and maybe see that through successfully and having the causes still there. So you had to pick up the larger issue. That was the fight. And it was a fight not, it, all these fights are not just against one issue. You are seeing it in the larger context. We were against Hadood. We were against the whole process of Islamization. We were against what it was doing to society. So we felt it was very, very essential to pick up that issue. And at that point, the jamaat e islami disagreed because naturally the jamaat e islami had played the major role in bringing these laws about. So there was this protest from the jamaat e islami at that time about the banners which were ca we were carrying, which were not just about the Farad case, they were against the hospital because of the role they had played in the Farad case, they were against the police, which the nurses felt very strongly about the police action taken in this case, and they were against the laws. At this point, this was a point of departure where Jamaat e Islam was concerned. They felt very strongly about it. We did try to carry through that this had played a major role in the rape case. And I still, all of us feel very strongly about it. Because with the induction of the Hadood laws, the cultural factors have always been there. Culturally, women have had the secondary status in this country. But the laws give these the sanction of, they give them the cover, the sanction of the law. And I was felt very strongly about it because with the reduction of the laws over the years, the cases of violence have been increasing, not gradually, but very rapidly, extremely rapidly. And one is now pushed into a corner. I mean, very frankly, we pick up cases where they have gone into court and one tries to help, one tries to highlight, one tries to bring out the issues. But in itself, one feels fairly helpless where the laws are concerned because women have no protection under the laws. The rapists have a total go-ahead. You have never come across a case where action has been taken against a rapist. You cannot prove a case of rape in this country under the current laws. So certainly that has given the impetus to violence against women. But what is why are the fundamentalists so preoccupied with women? Why did it actually focus on women, not just being the weakest? Uh, I mean, section of society, but there is a, there is a preoccupation. There, there is a preoccupation with women whenever the fundamentalists have had any say the, the target has been women. Uh, well, I suppose this brings in two or three areas. One, of course, as I've said, women are the weakest target. Two is certainly the whole concept of women being a property, of women belonging to you, of women being under your control. And uh, that to the fundamentalists, I think, has always been a very threatening aspect. Any talk of liberation or emancipation of women means the one control which they have automatically, which is over women of their household, and which extends then to women not merely in their households, but women anywhere else. That has been threatening to them because that is where, power, that is where they derive their power from. Where else do they have power? It's control over the family. And it's only as long as they can maintain that position of control, of ownership, that they can um, emerge as the stronger group or the party that gives them the, uh, 
their justification for being in any position of power. So definitely that has been an aspect and I think in the past they've also seen over the 1970 elections for the first time when women did move out a little bit and women uh, expressed their own view, they were out of control. The, the parties opposed to their ideas or thinking did come into power. And I think that once again brought home to them that unless they were able to keep a control over 50% of the population through Islam, they were threatened. So their own position was threatened. Women were the immediate target and very definitely... What is your third point? You said there were three elements. I said weakness of women, I mean being the weakest target, they're least likely to protest. Their own position being threatened as fundamentalists if women were allowed any sort of freedom which came about in the 1970 election and the third is purely personal. Women are a property, that is the whole cultural attitude and bringing in the Middle East concept of women, it became even uh, stronger, the concept of women purely as a property of men, they did not want to let them out of control.